there are some common problems that beginners run into when they're using the REPL. Uh, and it's important to understand uh, what exactly is happening when you run code in the REPL so that you can better address these issues. So in this video, I'll explain how Clojure code is evaluated and equip you with the knowledge to be able to solve some of these common problems. So the first important concepts to understand uh, when it comes to closure evaluation are symbols, vars, and namespaces. So symbols are just pieces of text that serve as identifiers. So this right here is a symbol. This is a symbol. Um, any text which uh, isn't a number like this uh, or isn't enclosed in quotes or preceded with a colon uh, can be considered a symbol. So this is a keyword, this is a number, this is a string, uh, and pretty much everything else is a symbol. Now the next concept to understand is a var. Uh, and vars serve as containers for values. Uh, they're a reference type like atoms and refs, which you may have learned about. Uh, you can put things in a var. And typically, uh, I won't go into the details of uh, everything that you can do with a var, but uh, for the most part, they're used to hold the values of uh, bindings that you define using def uh, and defin. And finally, we have namespaces. Uh, and namespaces, uh, you I mean, I'm sure most of you have an intuitive understanding of namespaces as just being a collection of names uh, and just being a prefix for them. But additionally, they uh, serve as mappings between symbols and vars. Uh, and to show how these are all uh, you know, tied together, uh, let me make a completely new namespace. So I'm going to say ns uh, foobar, and that's going to make a completely new namespace called foobar and put me into it. Um, and uh, when we're in this namespace, we can actually look up this mapping between symbols and vars uh, that I told you about. Uh, and I can do this using nsmap. Uh, and, and I have to give a namespace to nsmap. Um, I'm going to give it this special thing called star ns star. Uh, this simply represents the current namespace. So if I just do that, uh, it's the current namespace. And as you can see, the map itself has a whole bunch of things in it. Um, this is basically a, a bunch of things from uh, closure.core uh, and a few uh, Java class imports. Um, now let's look up a symbol in this map. Let's say um, I want to define uh, something called bar and I want it to have the value 42. I haven't defined it yet. Uh, so what happens if we try to look it up? I'm going to look up uh, in the map using get and I'm going to give it um, the key bar. Uh, and this is a symbol. Uh, and I'll explain a little bit later why I've put uh, this quotation mark uh, in front. But you'll see that if I get rid of the quotation mark, it fails. Um, it says unable to resolve symbol. And I'll talk more about what it means to resolve a symbol in just a bit. So I'm going to say this. Uh, if I try to look up bar in this map, uh, I don't get anything. It doesn't exist there. Um, but now I'm going to use def. So I'll say def bar uh, to 42. I'll hit enter. Um, and that seems to have worked. Now, if I do the same get, I get this uh, this funny looking thing here with the, the hash and the apostrophe. So this basically represents a var. Um, this is the syntax uh, uh, for a var literal. So if you have a symbol, uh, you, can, you can get its var by just prepending this hash apostrophe in front of it. That gives me the var. And if I have a var in hand, I can get the value that's contained in the var. Remember, a var is a container for a value. I can do this by using the deref function. Or uh, I can also uh, put an at in front of it, 
that does the same thing and we see that the value is 42 which is exactly what we defined it to be just a minute ago. So what does this mean? It means uh, that symbols are mapped to vars which themselves contain values. And when a def form is uh, executed, the following things happen. Uh, first, it checks to see if this symbol is already mapped in the namespace. So is it already in the namespace map? Uh, in this case, bar wasn't because we, we were just defining it for the first time. So if it's not in the namespace map, uh, then the body of the def is uh, evaluated. Uh, in this case, the body just evaluates to 42. Uh, and then a new var is created uh, and we're going to put this value into the var or the closure compiler puts it there, I should say. Uh, and then a mapping is created in the namespace. The symbol bar is mapped to this newly created var. Uh, so this mapping has been established for uh, the specific symbol bar. That's basically what def does. If uh, the symbol is already in the namespace, however, uh, it doesn't create a new var. Instead, uh, it evaluates the body and it just takes that body and puts it into uh, the currently uh, existing var uh, that's already there. And then it, um, you know, it replaces the old one. Uh, and the same rules apply to defin. Uh, this is because defin is in fact a macro which expands to def fn. Uh, so it's using def uh, under the hood. Uh, and if you're not familiar with what a macro is yet, uh, then just think of defin working exactly the same way as def, uh, except the value of the var is the function object itself. So in our namespace, if I just define a function so we can do the same thing that we did for the symbol bar I'm going to look up add to it gives me a var if I dereference it uh, it gives me this funny looking thing which is actually the function itself and I can verify that by calling the the fin predicate on it that gives me true so this is a function that you can call um, and I can even call it just like so. So we add two to two, we get four, we get five. So now that we understand uh, a little bit of this background, we can um, we can start to understand how closure code is evaluated in a little more detail. Uh, so closure is composed out of expressions or forms. Um, and the form is basically just anything that you can evaluate. Uh, there are literal forms, which are uh, just things that evaluate to themselves. So you, you just write them down um, and they are literally just themselves. So numbers, keywords, uh, symbols are literals if you put a quote in front of them. Uh, so that evaluates to itself. Oops that evaluates to itself. Um, and collections of literals are also themselves literals. What about symbols though? Uh, symbols are a little bit special. So you've seen that I've been putting quotes in front of these symbols. Uh, I'm now going to explain why that is. You can write a symbol with a quote or without one. Uh, if you write it with a quote, uh, then it will be evaluated as a literal. It's just going to evaluate to itself. The compiler isn't going to do anything special with it. However, if you evaluate it or you write it without a quote, then the compiler is going to resolve the symbol. It's going to um, go into the namespace. It'll take the symbol and look up its var. Um, and then once it has the var, it's going to get um, the value out of the var, uh, and that will be the result of uh, the evaluation. 
So this is effectively the same as this. This is how symbol evaluation works. Um, and if a sim and a symbol doesn't necessarily have to evaluate to a var, it can also evaluate to uh, something that's bound in a lead binding or something that's in a function parameter. Uh, but it, if it does um, resolve to a var, uh, then the value inside the var is looked up. So one last thing, if you have symbols inside, um, the collection literal syntax, then they're going to be evaluated uh, over here as well and they'll be replaced with their values. So we've covered literals, we've covered symbols, we've covered collection literals, but as you can see, most uh, closure code is written within these round parens. Um, so let's talk about how these round parens are evaluated. So uh, anything in, within round parens in Clojure is considered a list. Uh, so when Clojure encounters a list, first it's going to look at the, the very first element of the list. Uh, so that would be this or this for the, the parent list. Um, and uh, in the case of this expression, if the first element in the list is what is called a special form, then uh, there's a specific uh, set of evaluation rules that Clojure will follow. Uh, special forms, if you don't know what those are, you can think of them as being like keywords in other languages. Uh, they're reserved words. Um, they have their own special meaning and their own rules uh, as to how they work and how they're supposed to be evaluated. So def, uh, let, if is a special form to the way def works is, you know, it, it establishes this mapping that I just talked about. If uh, is something that, uh, you know, it branches, it either evaluates one branch or the other, it doesn't do both. Um, you know, they have special rules like that. <clears throat> There's really not that many special forms in Clojure though. Uh, so if it's not a special form uh, and it's a symbol, then the symbol is resolved. And the symbol could <clears throat> resolve to either a function or a macro. And so if it's a macro, um, I won't discuss macros in detail here, uh, but macros uh, will basically be uh, expanded and the, the code that follows that symbol, the rest of the list is basically going to be transformed in some way and then evaluated. Um, Again, I won't be covering macros in detail here. <clears throat> Let's move on to uh, the next case, which is uh, the symbol resolves and the var contains a function. Uh, and this is the most common case. Uh, and it's definitely what you see over here. Um, so if this resolves to a function, um, or if it's not a macro rather, then the var is resolved. And it should resolve to something that can be called like a function. It doesn't necessarily have to be this function object. Uh, it could be a keyword uh, or it could be a map because maps can be called like functions. It could be uh, a set uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, and then everything else is uh, evaluated. All the other elements of the list are evaluated. And then once everything in the list is evaluated, um, the rest of the elements, excluding the first, are passed as arguments uh, to this function. And the first value is, uh, you know, Clojure tries to call it like a function. And if it happens, uh, if it just so happens that this isn't actually a function, if it's just a number or something, Clojure is going to throw an error at you. So if we try to do bar uh, 42, it blows up because bar is actually a long and it can't be cast to uh, a function. And of course, whenever you call a function, uh, if it performs side effects, those side effects are gonna happen. So if the function prints, you'll see something printed. Uh, if it talks to a database, it's going to talk to a database. Uh, and the result or the value of this expression is the return value of the function. 
And so now we've understood uh, how just individual expressions and forms in Clojure are evaluated. Um, but let's talk a little bit more about uh, the benefits and the trade-offs of this system. So why was uh, the language designed to work this way uh, with, with these symbols and vars and all this, um, you know, indirection? So let's talk about compilation of a function for a minute. Uh, when you compile a function, um, the symbols in the function body um, will be resolved. Clojure is going to try to resolve them. Um, and all the symbols have to be defined somewhere. So this is in a let binding, so that's fine. This is fine. Um, but these are symbols too. Um, and in this case, the symbols uh, resolve to vars. So if a symbol resolves to a var, um, then when this compiled function is called, uh, it's going to, it isn't going to directly use the values of these vars. It's first going to look inside the var, uh, get the value out of it, uh, and then use it. So there's some indirection there. Uh, the function is always going to dynamically uh, look up uh, the value of the vars that it refers to. And this indirection is uh, actually what allows us to change uh, function definitions at the REPL freely. So for instance, we can call our um, function here, which looks up uh, a book name in our database. I'll give it an ID. It managed to look something up. It works. Uh, but what if I change the database name here? You see that we're referring to this DB spec um, uh, you know, symbol here. I can change this, and now I'm going to re-execute or rerun this def and nothing else. I'm not going to load the file. I'm going to run just the def. I haven't changed this function at all. I haven't even rerun uh, the def. In. And now if I try to run this function, it fails. It says database book doesn't exist, which means that this function has picked up on this change. Uh, and this is because it always, um, you know, if, if, it, if there's a var that it refers to, it always refers to it dynamically. It goes to the var and then looks inside uh, every single time. Um, and so this is uh, precisely what allows us to use the REPL uh, to change our functions and work with our code dynamically. Um, and now that we know this, uh, let's talk about uh, another topic, which is loading a file. So what exactly um, is loading a file? Well, it's very simple. Um, let me just load the file here. Uh, and loading a file is pretty much executing every single top level form in the file from top to bottom. And by top level form, I just mean uh, an expression that doesn't have a parent, so this and this. So when we load the file, it runs this, runs this, 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 and this, um, all in order from top to bottom. Um, so what does it mean to run def and to run defin? Uh, we covered that earlier. Uh, it's going to establish this mapping. Uh, and in the case of defin, it's also going to compile that function. So this means that I can actually use defin in the REPL to change a function if uh, I wanted to, instead of loading the entire file. So let's say I wanted to prepend uh, something uh, to the name of the book that I look up. There we go. Uh, now what I can do is I can execute only this defin, and I'll do that. Uh, and the change has taken effect. I didn't have to load the entire file. Just running this defin alone is sufficient. And of course, um, this is the same as copying the defin, pasting it. As long as I keep the name the same, um, I can change the body in whatever way I want. I can even change the arguments that it accepts as long as I keep the name the same. Because as long as the name is the same, um, it's going to update, it's going to find this symbol in the namespace and then it's going to update the var corresponding um, to that symbol. So if I do that, 
then we see that the uh, you know the prefix hello is now gone. But uh, there are some gotchas and issues that can result from this. Uh, this means that, uh, for instance, our file and the state in our REPL can go out of sync with each other. In fact, they're out of sync already because um, this definition uh, is actually prepending this string, but I've changed it in the REPL and the, the prepending isn't happening anymore. Uh, and so this is an issue. Uh, that can catch you off guard. Uh, and there are a few different ways this can happen. Uh, so one very common way that uh, these issues can arise is when you rename a function. So let's say I want to rename this function. I decide that that suffix in db isn't necessary. Uh, I'm going to load it. Uh, I'm going to come over here to my tests namespace, I'm going to load the tests, switch to this namespace, and let's run the tests just to make sure everything is working. And there seem to be no failures at all. Um, but clearly this shouldn't pass be passing because this is referring to a function that shouldn't exist anymore. We renamed this to lookup book name. Uh, so this needs to fail. What is going on here? Uh, well, if we look a little more closely at this namespace. Look up book name. Uh, so this is the new function. We renamed it to this. So there's a mapping just like you would expect. But what about the old mapping? The old mapping still exists as well. So uh, simply renaming the function and running the defin again didn't get rid of the old mapping. It just created a new one uh, for the new, uh, uh, you know, the new defin that was, uh, you know, run here. Uh, so one way to think of it is uh, running the first defin and then running uh, and then loading and changing it and loading it uh, is present. It's is essentially uh, the same as just typing the first function in the REPL, hitting enter, and then copying and pasting that code, um, and then renaming it, and then hitting enter again. So the second execution of the defin didn't know anything about the first. It's not going to get rid of that name for you. Uh, but now what do we do? Now how do we deal with this? Uh, how do we catch these errors? Of course, we could rename this. Um, but how do we prevent mistakes like this from happening? Or how do we mitigate them um, or handle them when they do happen? Um, because your REPL could fill up with, you know, all kinds of garbage state for various reasons. You might be developing or in the middle of writing some code. Uh, you've you've deft a whole bunch of uh, temporary names uh, and maybe you lo you've lost track of what you're doing. So what can you do? Uh, well, the most obvious solution is to restart the REPL, uh, which is slow. Uh, and I don't like the solution because it's slow and it disrupts my flow, uh, but it works. Uh, so if you are completely out of ideas, you have no idea what to do, um, I would restart the REPL. But uh, you should um, try not to restart the REPL because that can be quite disruptive uh, and, and slow. Uh, and there are some other solutions that you can use. Uh, one of them is this function called ns unmap. So ns unmap uh, takes a namespace. In this case, I'm going to give it the current namespace and I can give it a symbol. Uh, and what this will do is it will unmap, it'll remove this mapping from the namespace map. There we go. And now if we try to look it up, it's gone. And now if I just, uh, revert this back to what it was before. I load it uh, and now it complains that this var doesn't exist uh, because I removed it from with using NS map, unmap. NS unmap is, uh, is a way uh, to get rid of a symbol if you know exactly what is causing the problem. It'll remove what you give it, nothing more, nothing less. Uh, and another way is a library. It's called uh, tools.namespace. 
Uh, I'm not going to go into detail uh, as to all the features of this library. I just want to point out uh, one function called refresh. Uh, I'll link to this in the description, of course. Uh, and what refresh does is it'll look at your, uh, you know, your source directory. It'll look at all the files that have changed and it will throw away all the vars in those uh, namespaces, everything that you've defined. Uh, and it'll just reload everything uh, from a clean slate, pretty much. Um, and this is not necessarily always what you want because uh, you know sometimes maybe you're in the middle of something and you've defined some temporary names, you don't want them to go away. But if you refresh, uh, they will all go away. But it is useful if you want to start from a clean slate. Uh, and what I've actually done is I've added this namespace to my liningen profiles.clj. You can see it right here. Um, so that makes it available uh, in every liningen project that, I, um, that I'm working with during development. Uh, and I've also gone a step further and added a custom command in cursive, uh, which is my editor. Uh, so I set it up to actually uh, run this piece of code. It looks like something's blowing up. Look up book name in DB. Uh, where is that happening? So let's load this. It's being used here. So if I just rename this properly, And then I can completely refresh the REPL. Uh, so I set up this shortcut to just run this piece of code if I want to throw everything away and start from a clean slate. Um, I haven't mapped it to a key binding because I don't use it that often, uh, but it is there uh, whenever I need it. Uh, so moving on, another consequence of uh, this evaluation model is that we're not limited to changing vars that are only in our source code. We can even change vars that exist in libraries. Uh, so let's say, for example, uh, we're debugging some issue and we suspect that this function, uh, which comes from ring.util.response, uh, there might be some problem here. Uh, so we want to add some print statements to help us debug. Right? Uh, this is the definition. I can jump to its definition, but as you can see, I can't edit this file at all. Uh, but this doesn't stop me from switching to the namespace. I can still switch to the namespace. I can copy paste the code right here. And then I can just edit to my heart's content. Ring util response. And then I'll hit enter and that should change it. Um, and now if I call fetch book name to make sure I'm in the correct namespace. You can see that it's actually printing. Uh, even though it, it exists in a separate library, it isn't my code, I was still able to change it. Um, so I recommend that you do this only for debugging purposes. Um, you shouldn't be monkey patching uh, code so that it actually works in production. This is only something that you should resort to uh, if you're trying to track down some kind of bug. You can add print statements and you know even things like inline uh, defs to any third party code that you want. And so now that we know all of this background information, uh, we can finally understand why our ring server has to be restarted whenever we make a change to this handler. Uh, so for example, let's say I want this handler to just return hello world, right? Um, and I'm going to just compile this handler. I'm not going to change anything else. And let's come over here, start up the server. Um, And let's just hit the API. Uh, 
and this is still giving us um, this is actually still looking up the name in the database. It's using the previous implementation of fetch book name. Uh, so nothing has changed. Uh, so why is that? Uh, well, let's, let's use the knowledge that we have of the evaluation model. Um, the server is started by running this run jetty function, which returns the server instance um, that we're putting in this atom here. Um, at server. So that's an object, but we're not passing our handler. Uh, we're not giving fetch book name to our uh, run jetty function directly. It, it's going through this ring handler. And the ring handler refers to the routes. And then finally, the routes uh, refer to our fetch book name. So uh, recollect the evaluation model. Routes is in a def, uh, which means that the body of the def uh, is evaluated at the time when this def is evaluated, uh, which would mean that this was run and this symbol was resolved to a function a few minutes ago when I had uh, loaded all this into the REPL. So what that means is the symbol routes is mapped to a var, which contains, still contains, the old function object of fetch book name. Uh, we've changed the fetch book name var. We can test that. Uh, by calling it just like so. And this gives us hello world no matter what. Uh, so this var has been changed, but the var map to routes hasn't been changed yet. Uh, we can verify that by just getting a hold of this function. So routes is a vector. So we can do second routes. That's going to give us the function. We can call it. Um, with uh, our arguments here. And you can see that this is using the previous implementation. So how do we solve this problem? Well, we'll have to re-execute or re-evaluate our def. And if we do that, then this starts working the way that we expect. But it doesn't end here because the ring handler refers to our routes and this is in a def too. So we need to rerun this as well to update uh, the ring handler. Uh, so in, in practice, this shouldn't be an issue or too much of an issue for us because uh, these are all sitting in the same file. Uh, so if we just load the entire file like we usually do, all of this should be re-executed and ring handler uh, should be completely up to date. Uh, so we've reloaded this file, but it still doesn't work. It's still using the old implementation. So how is that happening? Well, let's look at um, how we're actually starting the server. So start server is a function, which means that if there are symbols inside of them, they'll be resolved to vars and this function is going to look up the var uh, or the value of the var dynamically every single time you call it. But we're not calling it every single time we get a request. We're only calling it once to start the server. Uh, and in fact, we're not calling our ring handler here. We're just giving it to run jetty. So the first time we called start server uh, just a few minutes ago, uh, it looked inside the var ring handler. It found our old ring handler function, uh, which didn't uh, have this new code, and it handed it off to run jetty. And then run jetty took it and used it to make this server object uh, that we see sitting in our atom here. Um, and so this server object is what actually has a hold on our um, our function that we want to change. But there's no way for us to change this server object directly. Uh, so we just have to stop it and then run start server again, which is again going to look uh, into uh, the var that this points to. Uh, this time it'll pick up the updated uh, ring handler and then hand it off to the server and everything should work. Uh, you can verify that by restarting the server. And now it has in fact picked up our change. Uh, but this is a little bothersome. We don't want to have to restart the server every single time we change our handlers. So what, what can we do? 
Uh, well, it turns out that you can call vars like functions. So if I were to define add two, I can of course call this the conventional way, uh, but I can also put a var at the beginning of a list. Uh, and so if closure finds a var at the beginning of a list, or if you're trying to call a var like a function, um, this is a var literal, uh, the uh, you know closure is going to look inside the var at runtime, dynamically get whatever it contains, and then try to call it as a function. Um, of course, this only works if um, you know whatever the var contains is actually a function. If at runtime it's not a function, it's going to blow up. It's going to say var is actually a long, but you're trying to use it as a function. So what can we do here now that we know that we can call vars like functions or we can use them in places where our code expects a function. Uh, since it's fetch book name specifically that we want to change over and over, we don't necessarily want to change routes or ring handler. We can just make this a var instead of you know directly referring to the symbol. And so now uh, if I just change this to Let's actually go back to our uh, form here where we were calling routes uh, or calling our handler by looking it up in our routes. So this gives us hello world. Now if I change this to something else and I, I, need, to, I need to load at least this function, then it works because uh, now the second element of routes is a var, uh, and when we try to call a var, it's always going to dynamically look up uh, its value. And so now, with this change, uh, if we pass this handler, which uh, is basically just a wrapped up var to run Jetty, uh, it should be completely dynamic. Uh, we we'll can verify by restarting our server one last time. Now, if we call this, we get goodbye world. Come back over and change it. Compile just this function. And it works. So this was uh, a bit of a longer video. There was a lot of information uh, in the video. I hoped uh, it all sort of came through and helped understand some of the quirks on the REPL and how it works and why it was designed this way. Uh, again, feel free to ask questions in the comments or in the forums linked in the description. Thank you for watching.